Welcome, everybody. It's great to see everyone. Uh, I'm Eric Potashnik, Chair of the Political Science Department. And I would first like to thank uh, the Watson Institute for co-sponsoring today's event. It's my uh, pleasure today to introduce the final speaker in uh, what I think has been a phenomenal series on challenges for democracy, a distinguished lecture series, um, Malatan. Professor Tan is Professor of Political Science at the University of New Mexico and Deputy Director of Advance, a National Science uh, Foundation-funded program to promote women and minority STEM faculty. Her work focuses on women's rights, social inequalities, and strategies to promote inclusion and diversity. She is the author of three books, including The Logic of Gender Justice, State Action on Women's Rights Around the World, which received the Best Book Award from the Human Rights uh, section of the International Studies Association. The book investigates when and why governments adopt policies that could promote women's political, economic, and social equality on a wide range of issues, from abortion and contraception, to publicly paid parental leave, to policies to combat violence against women. Through comparative analysis of state action in 70 countries, the book shows how different women's rights issues trigger different types of conflicts and follow different logics of reform. In so doing, the book illuminates both the opportunities and obstacles to social change for policymakers, advocates, and others seeking to advance women's rights. She's had an illustrious career. She's uh, uh, been chair of the Committee on the Status of Women in the Profession of the American Political Science Associ Association. In 2015, she was named an Andrew Carnegie Fellow. She's also been a fellow at the Kellogg Institute of the University of Notre Dame and the Radcliffe Institute of Harvard. And she's held the Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellowship in Japan. So it is a real pleasure to welcome you to Brown. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming. Um, I'm going to begin by talking a bit about the origins of this project and how it fits in with the arc of my career. I'd also like to acknowledge that uh, Francesca Yensenius is my co-author and co-conspirator in this project. She's based in Oslo, or else she might be uh, zooming in. So um, as Eric mentioned, um, my previous work has focused on the causes and the logics of uh, women's rights reforms. That is, I was looking at the origins and processes that led to the enactment of the global rights revolution for women. So these are massive changes in family law, in reproductive rights, in work-life balance, access to childcare, access to parental leave, equality in the workplace, uh, that took place across the global north and the global south starting in the late 1960s and continuing to the present. So I wrote three books that all focused on why this happened and on variation and why it happened in some places and not others, why it happened more on some issues and not other issues. But whenever I gave talks about this topic, people would ask, well, so what? So you get laws on the books. What difference does it make? These countries you're talking about, so many laws remain on paper. Why should we care? And so, years later, I'm finally trying to answer that question. So I call this effort now looking at the, the backside of the rights revolution, trying to address the so what question. So we have a lots of rights for women on the books. Has it made a difference? Has it changed people's lives? Um, so, so now I'll start the sort of more formal part of this pitch. So due to work that I've done, uh, work that a lot of other people have done, we have a lot of great findings about the front side of the rights revolution. Uh, Laurel Weldon and I have written about the role of autonomous feminist movements and transnational networks that succeeded in enacting broad second wave legislation to combat violence against women. Um, Omar Encarnacion and Mariela Deby have written about feminist street protests that triggered the legalization of abortion, for example, in Argentina. Um, I've also written on family law and the role of ecclesiastical powers in church-state relations in obstructing liberalizing reform of family law. We know that fertility declines in Europe and East Asia motivated governments of all political persuasions to support work-life balance <laughs> policies, so support for part-time work, expansion of parental leave, and so forth. Um, 
due to the work of Eileen Tripp and Lisa Valdez, we know a lot about the processes, the role of women's movements in post-civil conflicts and the role of CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, creating a process to hold governments accountable. Okay, but this is all on the front side. And there's still a lot of work to be done, but what's happening after? We can't assume that laws are effective. Uh, Andrew Schrank and I were in a project with Dan Brinks, uh, Steve Levitsky, and Vicky Murillo about weak institutions in Latin America. And more broadly, they shed light on uh, the presence of weak and unstable institutions across um, the global south. Even in the global north, progressive laws like the US Civil Rights Act are not aligned with social behavior. Okay, there's still an ongoing process taking decades to promote equality in corporations, in police departments, you know, all sorts of organizations. So there are law practice gaps in the global north and south due to resistance from above and below. So our book looks at whether and how women's rights laws have had an effect on social practices, whether they've changed attitudes and behavior in a more egalitarian direction. And I'm just going to bracket. We can talk about this in the Q&A if people want the question of what equality for women is. OK? So let's just sort of bracket that. We could talk for hours about what equality for women is and what gender equality is. So I'm just, gonna, I'm just talking in a broad direction. Um, so let's take a couple theoretical steps back. So the first part of this is going to set up a theory and then a framework. And then I'm going to tell some empirical stories based on original work we've done and work that we have um, borrowed from other people. So let's think at the most basic level. What do women's rights laws do? So category A tries to trigger social changes, push, motivate social changes that have yet to come to pass. And this is what most of us think about as social change laws. Try to push behavior in an egalitarian direction. Um, but there's a second category, category B, of laws that validate social changes that have already occurred. And I put emphasis on this because I worked in Latin America for a long time. Um, I worked in Latin America for a long time, and um, this was what I studied. I studied the legalization of divorce, the legalization of elective abortion. And social practice had already evolved far beyond the law, right? And so it wasn't a question of, of, of using the law to change behavior, but getting the law to align with behavior. Um, type A laws, we think about more typically. Laws to combat violence against women, um, laws to promote work-life balance, laws to combat workplace discrimination, childcare, equality in, 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 um, in family law, and so forth. Um, I just did actually these slides yesterday because it occurred to me that I needed to set this up theoretically a bit more. <laughs> so that order is not quite right. OK, so this figure, uh, the same um, Dan Brinks-led project that Andrew and I were participating in, he had this on the board. He created this figure for the project. And Andrew and I both thought it was really silly, and we were kind of like laughing at him. And here it is. I'm presenting it because I'm actually finding it quite helpful. <laughs> so what do type A laws do? The goal of the law, um, and a law as an institution, is to produce behavior that is more equal than the status quo. All right? So we have a pre-institutional outcome on the left and an institutional outcome on the right. And the idea is that the strong institution or the, the effective law is going to move behavior on the spectrum from the left to the right. That is, S is going to be greater than zero. S is the gap between the time one behavior and the time two behavior. Okay, so the law is going to push behavior <coughs> in this desirable direction. As Brinks, Levitsky, and Murillo say, an institution is strong that refracts power, authority, or expectations to produce this outcome. But the type B law works differently. <coughs> All right, the type B law um, is just trying to migrate de jure conditions to a de facto reality. So in this case, it's not the behavior that moves. It's just the law that catches up with behavior. So this project is just about type A laws. All right, it's just about laws that are trying to move behavior. But I want to put it in a broader context that when we're talking about women's rights or you know, rights for other historically excluded or marginalized groups, there are often a lot of type B laws. 
Okay, so the legalization of same-sex marriage we can think about as a type B law. The behavior is already occurring, but the law is then changing to validate and legitimize um, that behavior. All right, so today I'm just talking about type A laws. All right, so now we're gonna set up the framework, the comparative politics two by three in this case. So how do type A laws move behavior? There are three mechanisms. This is um, standard stuff in, in, in law and sociology. We're going to give it a, a little bit of a twist. But there are three mechanisms that tap into different motivations for human behavior. So the mechanisms are money, coercion, and norms. And then the second dimension, our framework, uh, refers to the target. The target or the person who is responsible for changing behavior to align with the law. And this target can be individuals in the general population or collective actors, companies, organizations, uh, parties, or universities. And so these two axes guide our project. So we have the two by three, meaning money, coercion, and norms, and then the target as individual actors and collective actors. So let me just go through briefly uh, the mechanisms. So money, states have money, people want money. And so the law can use this kind of lever to offer incentives for behavioral change. All right. Coercion. This is what we think about as, as classic legal power. States monopolize the legitimate use of force, um, and they impose punishments to compel behavioral change, to compel compliance with the law, and to deter violations. And the literature on criminology, um, with variations, says that coercion tends to work when enforcement is certain and the consequences are, are severe. But as we know from the project that Andrew and I were, are in, um, many states lack the will to surveil and enforce and they often lack the capacity. But it's not just capacity, it's a question of, of, of will. It's costly for the state to enforce. Um, states can coerce individuals and collective actors. And finally, norms. This is less studied, but very important, and as we'll see, uh, even when coercion and financial incentives are not available, states can have power through these expressive mechanisms. Because there is an expressive function of a law. Uh, Marianne Glendon wrote about this, that the law tells a story. It sends a message about who we are and where we're going. And people often, um, it, so it's, it sets up norms. It communicates information about norms. And people comply with norms uh, because they want to fit in. They don't want to get ostracized, and they want to maintain the esteem of other members of their community. So we build on Richard McAdams' theory of the origins of a new norm and um, his, uh, his theory about why people, why people comply. And I have a quote here on the bottom from Catherine McKinnon, who agrees with Richard McAdams and says that the real function of the law is not uh, just incarceration or damage, but legal socialization and education. So she and McAdams are both sort of naming expressive power as an important mechanism that the law affects society. Okay, so um, that's axis one. So the second axis going down is who's the target? Individuals or collective actors? And these different targets imply a different domain for us to study the effects of the law. And this will become more clear in a second. Um, I'm going to skip over that. So what's our research design? Um, two by three leads to six stories. Uh, so in each of these chapters, empirical chapters, we're going to give a global overview of what the statutory change was, and then we're going to tell a story of legal enactment or social change in line with what the law wanted. And so these stories are going to come from Norway, India, the U.S., um, I'm not sure if Argentina is going to be in there or not, Mexico and Japan. Uh, and we are taking a multi-method approach that's a little bit of a grab bag because this is not a systematic study of enactment across cases, but it is um, using the best data we have to show the effects of the law within national contexts. All right. I don't know if anybody has any ideas to do a cross-national study of legal effects. That would be great. I think it would be empirically challenging, but within countries, um, we've done field work, ethnography, 
we've done interviews, we've done a field experiment, uh, we're going to try and do a survey experiment in Japan, and we've used survey data from existing sources. So this is like grab data, analyze, and then um, reflect. Okay, so here is the two by three in action. Um, this is new. We're trying to write the book, uh, the bulk of the book this year. Um, I told some of you in, in meetings today, but uh, Francesca and I, she's based in Oslo, and we have a hard time working together unless we're in the same time zone. <laughs> so I went to Norway last month, and the product was this two by three. So we really sat together, and we tried to create this, um, this two by three. Okay, so story one. So we're going to go across rows. And this is very much a work in progress because I actually changed the order just this morning. And yesterday she decided to change story, story two. Um, no, story, yes, yeah, story two. So the location, this is, this is a moving thing, and so I'm very interested um, in your feedback. Okay, but so first we're going to talk about the target as the general population. And I'm not going to go on with all of these details because um, I actually want to have, you know, back and forth and, and hear your perspectives. Um, so I'm going to go across the general population talking about money, coercion, and norms. And then I'm going to talk about, uh, I don't know what happened here, but this is supposed to say collective actors. Okay. And then um, we're going to talk about a couple more stories about um, the use of coercion and the use of norms to try to change collective actors. All right. Story one, daddy leave, changing gender roles in parenting. And the moral of this story is that financial incentives can move behavior in supportive contexts. So for those of you who work on the welfare state, um, you'll know that the most recent welfare state gender equality project is gender role change. And this is because decades of the rights revolution, which promoted women's advancement, hit a wall, right? So at a certain point, um, women are participating in the labor force, more educated than men, but bias is still persisting, women are getting paid less, there's still occupational segregation, and so a lot of people reflected and decided to put more emphasis in um, the project of changing gender roles, okay? So equality for women requires that men in heterosexual partnerships, especially, that their lives also change, that men assume a greater role in caregiving. Because if men are, you know, in heterosexual partnerships working 24-7, that's normative, right? And, um, and we're not going to get to, to equality. So um, gender roles in the family, even for women who are workaholics, women who are not in these partnerships, uh, women who decide not to have children. There's evidence from the work of Shelley Carell, Cecilia Ridgway, that this gender system creates stereotypes that harm everybody, even people whose lives don't actually conform. So, um, so the project in the last couple of decades has been men's lives. And so this story looks at the extent to which state projects to change gender roles using money as a financial incentive have worked. And so um, we look at daddy leave, so paid parental leave for men. And this is just an OECD thing. This is actually really small. But it sets up the two cases that we're looking at. So we're looking at Norway as a success story of gender role change through financial incentives. So Norway, since the 70s, had paid parental leave for men and women. But it was largely women who took it. And so in 1986, um, the government appointed a masculinity commission to contemplate men's roles and men's lives. And this was headed by Jens Stoltenberg, who then became Secretary General of the United Na of, of NATO, of NATO, right? And um, they decided that masculinity involved greater fathering, all right? So masculinity needed to expand conceptually. And then the Norwegian parliament was the first in the world to enact a daddy quota, which is a use it or lose it parental leave. And there's really good data on how quickly this daddy quota changed behavior. 
So before the quota, fewer than 3% of men took leave. And this rose to 25% in the one month after the law was enacted. And then 60% a few decades later, and in 2018, which is our comparison, 71%. There are also a lot of studies showing that this had positive you know, spillover effects for um, <coughs> other gender roles in the household, right? Household work, and that it also improved child well-being in some respects. And if you go to Norway now, you'll see that, you know, fathering is totally normative. Um, there are men with infants in public spaces in the middle of the week. So this is all like ethnography, right? And the parks in the cities anyway are filled with like men with strollers. And what's really interesting is that this guy is not a dad, but he's a daycare worker. That there are like male daycare workers with toddlers, which is also something you don't see. Um, and these are just data showing that uh, Can, the unpaid... Can I ask you a question? I'm sorry. Yeah? Of Was course. The mothers and the fathers the same amount of time? So they can. They can take the same amount of time. But the use it or lose it means that if the couple who takes less leave doesn't take this two months, they lose the, they lose the money. So the women get two months, the men get two months? Uh, Anybody can take up to 10, and the other person has to take two for almost full pay. But so that was the innovation of daddy leave, is that it's, it's gender neutral, meaning it's gender neutral. It's not said man, woman, if it's like, you know, two men. Right, right, right. Um, the the non-dominant parent, the non-primary parent, needs to take at least two months, or they lose the money. It's sort of, yeah, it's sort of mandatory, but it's really worked, but it hasn't worked in Japan, okay? So Japan actually has the most generous paternity leave in the OECD. <coughs> Men have 52 weeks at 60% pay, which is like 40 weeks effectively at full pay. That's the most generous in the OECD, but... 6% of working fathers take the leave. All right. So it's not just the financial incentives. All right. And Japan has been trying for decades because their birth rate is very low. And so they've been trying for decades to throw money at childcare, throw money at parental leave, um, and then even create a social marketing campaign uh, that, that branded this concept of ikumen which merges IKG, Ikuji, which is care, and Ikemen, which is good-looking man, into an Ikuman, which is a good-looking man who cares for kids. <laughs> right? And this was like, you know, the, the, um, the text analysis showed that for a couple of years, this was like the, the, the hottest term <laughs> in the media. Right? But still, throwing money at the problem, only 6% of working fathers take leave. And I'm not talking about two months of leave. I mean, like, any leave. So um, this is an Ikumen, right? So when I actually had my first child in Japan in 2006, you never saw this. My husband was the only one wearing a baby and a Bjorn on the Tokyo subway. But then when we went back in 2017, this, at least on the weekends, was more common. So the difference with Norway is that in Norway, this is the weekday, right? In Japan, it's now become hip, at least in the cities, you know, to, have, to wear a yarn and have a baby for men, but on the weekends, right? Um, so we, we um, uh, got some survey data, and there's a gap, because normatively people actually subscribe to this desire to balance work and family, <coughs> but the social conditions um, are, are not supportive. And so we, we wrote a paper that hasn't been published, right? We wrote a paper trying to ask why. Like, what's happening in this Ecomen project? and why not? And um, this is an interview at the global headquarters of Hitachi. Um, and the guy in the middle is a Hitachi global CEO. But this guy here, he was saying, you know, I'm 50, I have three daughters, I never took a day of paternity leave. And we're like, why? And he goes, it just never even occurred to me. And he also told a story that Francesca likes to repeat which is that he was managing the Hitachi office in India. And he was really frustrated because families mattered so much to people in India and he couldn't get anybody to come in on the weekends. 
like he was used to, you know, <laughs> having his staff come in on the weekends and they wouldn't. So, so the, the moral of the story here is that in Norway, other societal institutions, the workplace, politics, are pushing in the same direction as the intention of this paternity leave. And in Japan, the other institutions, the household registration system, the seniority system in corporations, uh, overtime culture, the tax system, the pension system, are all pushing in the opposite direction. So even though the state is throwing tons of money at this problem, and has been for decades, there are a lot of countervailing institutions that are, that are pushing back. All right. So the, the money thing works is the moral of the story, but only if there is a supportive context. Um, how long am I supposed to, should I talk until? Um, you can talk for 45 minutes. Yeah, that's a long time. I mean, I can, yeah. 36 minutes, okay. 24. <laughs> <laughs> so how about like 20 more minutes? I mean, I have, I have a lot of, I have a lot of stories, but, um, but uh, yeah, it's a lot. So here is story two, and now we're on coercion, okay? Coercion, the individual level. And we just changed this story to be sex selective abortion in India. Right, we just changed the story. Um, but basically, uh, and it's a twist on the abortion thing, because of course what people want to talk about post Dobbs is like the legalization of abortion, like Catherine and I were talking, were talking earlier. And there's a lot of global variation in the, legal, in, in, in the conditions of legal abortion, right? And so there's a lot to study. Um, but the story we're gonna tell is about how in cases when abortion is permitted, it can get abused, especially in countries in Asia where there is a persisting boy preference. So this map, and this is data that um, Pradeep Chibber and Francesca uh, analyzed, and this, is, this map is looking at, um, at the district level, I think it's the district level, at the child sex ratio in 2011. This isn't the overall sex ratio which is a different picture because it reflects what happens in adulthood. This is the child sex ratio ages zero to six. And so in spite of the fact that since 1994, India has banned sex selective abortion, and they've done it by banning the use of ultrasound technology to inform people about the baby's sex. The sex ratio has gotten worse. So in 1991, 945 girls for a thousand boys, 2,927 girls for a thousand boys, 2,011, 918 girls for a thousand boys. But actually, the consensus among scholars is that it would be even worse if the law didn't exist, right? That it would be even, even more distorted. And so, what are they finding? Well, Amartya Sen named this problem missing women in 1990 and said that there are, you know, millions of missing women in South Asia and East Asia because of this boy preference. But is it sex selective abortion, neglect, infanticide, um, you know, the allocation of healthcare resources asymmetrically? Well, Francesca's work, Francesca with Pradeep, they found that it's both. And it depends on the education level of the mother. All right, so women with a graduate degree and above actually are practicing sex-selective abortions at a greater rate. So the more educated a woman is, the more likely um, is there to be a distorted child sex ratio at birth. Okay, so that's the children ever born, the light bar. All right, so 888 to 1,000, which is huge. But among people who are illiterate or who have very low education, the children ever born, the sex ratio is less, but it changes in the first years of life. So less educated people are more likely through neglect, maybe not infanticide, but through neglect and asymmetrical allocation of resources to generate the sex ratio later on, a distorted sex ratio later on. So, um, so the law is having very differential effects by education level or the whole policy, the whole context. Okay, so this, so, so let me just go back to here for a second. Sorry, no, to look at this. Um, the, the critique of the, uh, of the Dan Brinks thing, right, is that there's no single society, there might be societal institutional outcome, 
But if we take an intersectional perspective, there are multiple points, right? There are multiple points on the line, depending on your social position. So it's quite heterogeneous. And then if the law has a boomerang effect, you know, the institutional outcome could be, you know, way over on the, on the other side. It could, be, it could be backward. And we do see boomerang effects for a lot of equal rights, equal rights policies. Um, so that'll be in the next graph. Okay, sorry. This is like, um, all right. So let's move on to the next story. Uh, so the next story is a really optimistic one, but um, this is a story about whether the very hard fought for second generation violence against women laws have had any impact on society. So by first generation laws, we refer to like the criminalization of marital rape, the typification of domestic violence. Uh, that happened in the 80s and the 90s. But by the 2000s, the second wave women's movement uh, did a lot of conceptual work on this concept of violence. And they began to link formerly like disparate phenomena, female genital mutilation, intimate partner violence, <coughs> stalking, harassment, um, eve teasing, political violence, like all of these became different parts of the concept of violence against women, all of which had an underlying context, which was the cultural and structural subordination of women. All right, so the second wave of violence against women legislation, including this um, law that we study in Mexico, enacted in 2007, reflected international human rights norms, and it sought to combat all of these forms of violence. So it's a huge, very broad law that is a perfect example of what we would expect to be a parchment law, because it's so ambitious, it's so comprehensive, and it's just like the Brazilian constitution, it's taking on a zillion things, and how can this possibly have any impact? Because it's so broad, it's so mega, it's meta. And in this story, we actually show that this very broad law called the general law for women to have a life free of violence. How ambitious is that? Hmm. It actually has produced a discernible effect, okay? And this is a story that totally goes against the conventional wisdom because the conventional wisdom generated by the media is that violence in Mexico is, is worse than ever, right? They're national strikes of women, not working, not going to school to call attention to violence and say, well, what would a day without us look like? Like a Lysistrata type of, type of strike, All right? So this is, the, this is the national strike. People filled the streets. The impression is that things are worse than ever. And we're actually showing that it's not true. Things are terrible, right? Two thirds of women have experienced an act of violence in their lifetimes, um, but it's getting better. So what we do is we, we take this um, body of survey data that surprisingly few people have worked with because it involves four waves from 2003 to 2016. And look at the numbers of women who have been interviewed in this survey, up to 142,000 in the 2016 wave. And these are very detailed questions about working conditions experiences of violence in the home, in the street, in public institutions. We were talking about the, um, the figure of obstetrical violence, which they're also trying to measure. Uh, they involved um, in-person interviews, so it's not an online survey or anything, in-person interviews, and lots of different questions. Um, in our analysis, uh, we focus on women in a relationship, okay, to make the sample comparable. Because, of course, the first question we get is, well, are you measuring the same people? But we focus on women currently in a relationship. All right, so what we're doing here is this big ambitious law. We're assuming it has little coercive power, right? We're just assuming that, and maybe that's wrong, but it's not gonna be enforced very well. Um, we're assuming that it has a little financial power because there's very little money behind it, right? Um, and there are no financial incentives given for compliance, but we're betting that it has some expressive power or some normative power. And so we uh, um, take Richard McAdams' theory about the emergence of a new norm 
And he says there are three conditions. There are three conditions under which a new norm will emerge. One, a growing <coughs> consensus that the behavior is not acceptable or that it's desirable. Okay, so in our case, the growing consensus that the violence is unacceptable. Two, a greater detection risk. And three, more <laughs> widespread knowledge of the detection risk and of the <coughs> desirability or lack of desirability of the behavior. So we operationalize this theory and we say, so there are four observable implications then of a change in norm. <coughs> One is there's a behavioral change. Okay, but we could attribute that to a bunch of other factors. But what are the observable implications of a norm change? A decline in attitudes conducive to domestic abuse, which tells us that the behavior is less acceptable. More women reporting to the authorities or to family and friends, which is a sign that the detection <coughs> risk has increased. And then greater knowledge of the law, which is sort of a proxy measurement for more widespread knowledge of detection risk and lack of acceptability. And so the first condition, we find, and this is the share of women saying they experienced domestic abuse in the previous year. Now, who surveys, and a lot of surveys, take the lifetime incidents? And that doesn't change much. I mean, you'd have to have a whole new generation to see a change. But um, people analyzing the DHS surveys, as well as our analysis of this survey, are just taking the previous year, because then you can actually see change over time within the same generation. And so we find that in 2003, it's bad. 41% about of women in a relationship say they had experienced domestic abuse in the previous year. Um, but this goes down to 27 by 2016. So there is a reduction, 1.5 fewer, 1.5 million fewer women between survey waves are saying they experienced domestic abuse. What about attitudes? Um, so we have other stuff um, in this, but take a wife should obey her partner. 56%, and that's the right panel, in 2003. So these are attitudes, not about violence, is violence okay? Everybody's gonna say no, right? Nobody's gonna say violence is okay. But what it taps into is attitudes, you know, the cultural context supporting violence or making violence normalized and acceptable. Does a wife, should a wife obey her partner? More than half of people in 2003, and this drops to half by 2011, which is a huge change in cultural attitudes endorsing violence. A man has the right to hit his wife. Well, um, not that many, but it drops even more, 10%. 10% is a lot, saying a man has a right to hit his wife. And that also drops a lot. Okay, um, detection risk. So if you're never gonna get, to, if it, so, um, so remember McAdams' second condition for the emergence of a new norm is uh, whether there's any risk that you'll be found out if you violate the norm. So here is the share of women who had experienced domestic abuse in the previous year saying they reported it to the authorities. And this is always gonna be low. And authority here is not just the police. It could be social services, family welfare, hospital, et cetera. So it could be a range of public welfare agencies, not just the police. But this also grows from about 9% to almost 18% in 2016. So this is pretty significant. All right. Um, when we look at whether women are telling family and friends, talking to relatives or talking to friends, there's also a growth trend um, in favor of feeling more empowered to talk about this. It's less risky to talk about the violence I've experienced. And so these trends are all consistent with a change in norms. And we're not causally identifying the effect of the law on its own. We actually have a lot in this paper that's saying this is a bundled effect of you know, legal change, feminist activism to bring the law home, and also media coverage about violations and that imposing you know, reputational costs on, um, on, on not just um, aggressors, but also on public officials who did nothing. Um, so this bundled effect uh, is likely having um, an impact on societal behavior, okay, to align, to align with the law. All right, um, 515, uh, let's see. This is another very long story. 
So I'm going to summarize. <laughs> this is also original research that we did. Um, so what we kind of did was, you know, work on these discrete projects about effects of the law and changes in women's rights on the ground. And then we've tried to retroactively package it together as a book with some kind of common framework, right? And so this story um, is actually, you know, based on the United States, and it's looking at um, the implementation of Title IX. And we got into the story because um, the University of New Mexico was the subject of a Department of Justice investigation, all right? So there were um, cases of, of rape of female students, and the university was handling it poorly, as often happens. And through a stroke of bad luck for the university, um, the daughter of one of the victim survivors, uh, her mother was friends with the US attorney. And so the mother kind of reached out to the US attorney and said, you know, this is going on, nobody's doing anything. And so he said, oh, I'll call up Washington. And they launched a huge investigation because often the investigations for Title IX violations come from um, the DOE, from the Office of Civil Rights and the Department of Education. But this was a full-on Department of Justice investigation into Title IX compliance. And, um, and so the Dean of Students came to our faculty meeting, this was in the, in the political science department, and said, you know, I just need to let you know that we've had this investigation, we have this agreement with Justice now, they're gonna monitor us for five years, and we have to do you know, all of these things to comply, including rolling out a preventative training, a mandatory in-person training for all 27,000 students. And I was like, well, um, is there any evidence that this works? Uh, I don't know. Um, is anybody studying this? Um, no. And so I tried to get somebody else from like public health or something to study it and nobody was biting. And so I'm like, okay, Francesca, I think we have to study this. I mean, this whole thing is going on around campus for the next year. Like we have to study this. And so finally we got this paper published that involved three quasi-field experiments on the effects of his training. So the story here is about the effects of Title IX, which is a coercion of collective actors, because basically they lose revenue, right? They lose scholarship money, they lose federal research money if they don't comply with Title IX. And so they're coercing universities to have reporting procedures, grievance procedures, you know, changing policy, um, and doing this preventative training. All right, so this is our case of coercion of collective actors. Um, but I just want to show you some of the, uh, some, some of these experiments because they were so interesting. Um, we had to uh, work with the Dean of Students Office who was doing these trainings during new student orientation and then in big sessions, big mandatory sessions of existing students. And so we're like, okay, they said, well, you can have 10 minutes for a survey, 10 minutes for a survey. And so we, as if randomly, so this is an as if random, we took two subsequent sessions of new student orientation, one one week and one the other, and we considered them to be, you know, basically the same group of students. So as if the students were randomly in one group and one in the other. And then we administered the survey before the training with one group and then the survey after the training with the other group. Um, with another session, we actually were able to randomly assign people to these, this A and B group. But, um, so this was existing students and we actually had like different colored cards, so they had to go into the room and we randomly assigned them. So we, anyway, this is actually like on the ground. You have to have a lot of cooperation from university authorities and university staff to do this. But basically, you know, we found that this enormously expensive exercise, which is going on in hundreds of universities across the country, although usually online, ours had to be in person, is having, yes, an effect on people's knowledge and attitudes, and one surprising finding, but it's extremely modest. It's extremely modest. So there's some knowledge on, um, there's, some, uh, there's some movement on rape myths which is the sociological scale about people's attitudes, you know, that taps into um, 
their views about rape. And we see among both, especially among, um, among uh, male students, so we asked questions about transgender and non-binary, but um, the numbers were very small, so we don't report them here because then people are more likely to be identifiable. But you see a movement, right, in people's adherence to these, to these rape myths, especially among men after the training. Um, and then, uh, okay, so, so we found the effects to be extremely modest. And when the Department of Justice came to visit, I actually told them, well, these are, these are modest effects and we're actually finding a counterproductive effect, which is that among female respondents, they're significantly less likely to say they'll report sexual assault to the university after going through the training. Okay, Significantly less likely. So there's a drop from 88% to 76%, a 12 percentage point drop in the share of women who say, if I were sexually assaulted by another student, I would be likely to report this. There's a drop in that after sitting through training. So the training is having a super counterproductive effect, at least on stated intentions of behavior. The Department of Justice was like, okay, you know, so so the story that we're telling here about um, uh, the 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 coercion of of collective actors, and I think that Frank Dobbin and Lauren Edelman would tell the same story about the Civil Rights Act in U.S. corporations, is that compliance happens because they don't want to lose the money, but it can be very superficial, right? It can be very like box checking, and it takes a lot of work on the ground to actually make these changes required by the law um, meaningful. All right, so we did this, and um, I'm just going to, I'm going to start wrapping up now. Um, this is our story six, where we actually want to study, again in Japan, the effects of work style reform, all right, which is another Japanese effort that so far is, it, both it lacks teeth and it's not having an effect, but but there is a work style reform law now that's capping overtime, but at 100 hours a month. So if you're already working, you know, 80 hours, you can't work more than 25 more a week. Um, but basically, you know, this is the big obstacle also to women's integration of the workforce, to career, to career. Yeah, people are looking at this like, yeah. Um, so we, um, we want to test like, you know, under what conditions does norm change ignite on this overwork, on, the, on this overwork issue? So we're probably going to do a survey experiment about that. But let me start wrapping up. And so I told the moral of these stories already um, about money, that money can work sometimes if the societal context is supportive. Um, coercion also can work on collective actors like U.S. companies, U.S. universities, uh, we also may tell a story about political parties in Argentina who were effectively coerced into including women on candidate lists because um, feminists went and they, you know, exposed non-compliant lists to electoral judges who threw out lists that didn't have women in the electable positions. So they were coerced into doing this, but there was an enforcement, you know, an enforcement effort. Um, uh, but it's tough to apply coercion in the case of sex selective abortion in India if norms are way out of alignment, right? Um, and then finally, um, you know, the story of Mexico that I told about violence against women, it's not just that the law kind of announced itself and had this effect, but it took a lot of bottom-up effort to make the law relevant for, um, for people's lives. So, um, so I think that, you know, there are many levers and targets but, um, but, uh, but it takes work in society at the, you know, the level of healthcare administration, of middle management in corporations, of leadership in academic units, right, to actually work to make these, these laws have effects. So the rights revolution on the books is one thing, but it takes, like, you know, the whole society, really, to organize around... Um, around implementation. And then we can see tangible changes. So I guess just I'll conclude very briefly challenges for democracy. And I'm not going to say that much, except that, um, you know, in, in thinking about these issues, I found that uh, to really get into the meat of, you know, what's going on with sexual harassment or what's going on with violence against women and, um, you know, what's going on with sex selective abortion or parental leave, 
I, I move farther and farther from political science and from works written by political scientists and conversations happening in political science, okay? Because people are, are really stuck in, you know, the show of what politicians say and what's going on in elections and, and what's going on in elected bodies. And all of this action, in, in this project anyway, is at the, like the meso level. And that's not where a lot of political science is looking. And so for me anyway, like, you know, I've, I've, I've meandered farther and farther. And I think that's a problem for democracy in the study of democratic institutions. Because these issues of, of making rights real and effective, that's, that should be what the study of democracy is about. And yet it's not. And in political science, we're lacking the attention and the tools to get into these issues. So, so this is a problem for the study of democracy. But thank you very much for being Great. here. So I think we have some time for some questions. So people should just come up to the mics. You say you're moving away from political science kind of themes, but um, my question had to do with descriptive representation and the empowerment of women in government. And you don't have that as part of the story here. And yet we are seeing women advancing politically. And is that going to be something that you think about when you look at your case studies? So you and I talked about this earlier today, so thank you for the question. Um, and I think, you know, I've studied women in government a lot, and I've studied gender quotas, and, and I studied women's leadership. I mean, that's kind of how I got into this in the 90s when the Inter-American Development Bank was launching a fund for women's leadership, and I wrote the background paper as a graduate student, um, you know, sort of a diagnostic of women in positions of leadership in, like, 96. And so I've, I, I, um, you know, I worked with women leaders then, and what was really striking to me, and I wrote about this in the preface to my Inclusion with Representation book, is that they were so diverse. You know, the women that we were working with in this leadership network of the Americas, they were, the, even, and even the discussions about what it meant to have women in power. There were some who said, you know, women have to fight for women's rights, like women have to have this left-leaning liberal agenda, or else what's the point? And there was a woman from Canada, I think she had been prime minister in Canada, who said, well, if they're dictators, you know, we want women to be dictators too. Like, they were all over the place. And so, you know, I never thought that there was like, like a women's agenda. There was too much heterogeneity. And so, I mean, I think we have evidence, right, that women's presence does, leads to change leads to some changes depending on, on what you're measuring, right? I mean, you and I agree that we're not going to see revolutionary change in outcomes. But we see different topics introduced for the discussion. We see different, you know, bill submission patterns. And I think that, you know, for some issues, women's presence has mattered a lot. For other issues, it's not, it's not relevant. Like the enactment of family law, it takes far more than a coalition of people in parliament to, like, break the clerical power behind, you know, sexist sexist family law and so so i do think it's important and certainly women in government have participated in the coalitions and and they can monitor and help trigger enforcement mechanisms but it's not the only it's not the only story it's not the only story um and just i'll say one more thing that you know i work a lot on this issue in stem and there are differences at the meso level like when there are more women in engineering departments as faculty, the climate does change. And so I think that at the meso level is probably there's less socialization at the, than at the top. Meaning I used to say that to get to the top, power is a more potent and effective socializer than gender identity, right? So by the time you get to the top, like they're very similar. Um, but I think that, you know, at the meso level leadership, uh, ha having women does create often better conditions for enacting, you know, egalitarian, egalitarian changes. So thank you. Thank you for this wonderful Yay. talk, Mala. Um, so I want to pick up on the theme of leadership because what came to my mind at the very end, as you were wrapping up, thinking about, you know, the importance of what's happening at kind of a micro scale. Um, 
to me, that seemed like, well, that says leadership really matters. Yeah. And, you know, leaving aside the question whether it's women in leadership or not, just the fact of people stepping up um, and being able to be effective in their smallish groups. And I wonder if there's a place or a way of incorporating a leadership variable yeah. somehow, or if that would be valuable in any way, what you think about that. No, I love that question, and it follows perfectly from what um, Catherine was asking. So, so the National Academy of Sciences, sexual harassment in, um, you know, science, engineering, and medicine report. It came out in 2018. That report says the most important factor predicting the degree of sexual harassment in an organization is leadership. <laughs> you know, does leadership tolerate harassment or do they have a zero tolerance policy? And so you're right. It makes a huge difference, right? Leadership, you know, you can hold leadership accountable. Leadership takes the issue seriously. So this is at the meso level, right? But it, it is, it's the biggest predictor in corporations and in universities, right? Because it has a turn effect. You know, there's certainty that these penalties will be enforced. Um, but uh, political science has always eschewed the study of leadership. Like I remember in graduate school, and you know, Bob Putnam would kind of make fun of leadership as being like this big <laughs> category that it was like, I can't remember the, the term he used, but, but Jorge, you know, Jorge Dominguez, like all of the empirical political scientists made fun of leadership because they said it explains everything and it explains nothing. And so like you and I, and you know, we look out the window and we know it's incredibly important, right? But, but I don't know if social scientists have ever been able to like measure this or take this on in a way that, um, that, that, that avoids that means everything and nothing. Like it accounts for everything and nothing. I don't know if anybody has anything. Yeah, I mean, I, so I used to teach at the School of Leadership and Public Policy at the University <laughs> of Virginia. Um, and so I was kind of forced to, to talk about some of these issues. And you're, of course, exactly right. I mean, right. This, is, this has been an ongoing. There's been recent efforts that have been good. There's a nice recent edited volume by Craig Walden and Jeff Jenkins that has um, uh, chapters by a lot of good scholars trying to make some analytic sense of leadership and how to think about it in different contexts. So that would be one place to look. Um, but while I'm up, I'm going to ask a question, if that's okay. Um, so thank you for the talk. Um, uh, fascinating, and not only, I think, timely and important, but but you're, these are analytically hard questions. Yes. And so I'm wondering about maybe yeah. making a sharper distinction between implementation, and you talked about meso-level actors, and ultimate social outcomes. Mm -hmm. So implementation would be whether actors are actually energetically, faithfully, you know, trying to put into effect the policies, and under what conditions does that happen, and when it doesn't happen, and, and, and why. There is, I think, a large literature in political science and public administration about implementation going back to the 70s. Yeah. And we do know something about those conditions. The, the latter issue about, you know, does this particular policy cause outcomes in year T plus five to be different than yeah. it otherwise would be, yeah. is a really hard causal inference question. Yes. Because, I mean, economists spend their entire life doing program evaluation just trying to figure out if this one policy made a difference because so many other things are happening at the same time. And of course, you could very effectively implement a policy that actually doesn't doesn't change the world, not because you weren't trying, but because it was actually the design of the policy was flawed. Or, as you suggest in one of your cases, the policy might be effective and the outcomes look like it didn't do anything, but actually the outcomes would have been worse had it not even been for the policy. And so we can't say necessarily because trends are negative that the policy had no impact, maybe it would have even been, been worse. And, and that second question is so difficult to tease out that I'm wondering about maybe focusing even more just on the, the implementation uh, and under what conditions do we see 
delay, I mean, all the, pol there's a whole politics of implementation, you know, opponents of the law who lost at the enactment stage coming back afterwards and blocking it or defunding it or finding ways of making only token efforts and all sorts of ways and, and, and trying to focus a little bit more on some of those actors that are observable might be um, something that would help us explain differences across the cases. So, um, I really like the way that you're carving out two different types of dependent variables for this kind of study, like implementation and, you know, good faith efforts to implement is one dependent variable, right? And then societal outcomes on the ground is another dependent variable. And you're right, it's analytically, like, almost impossible. It's really hard. Yes. But... I think that's what we want to do. And we're never going to get past really tough causal inference people. But, you know, we had the lead article in world politics with this violence against women in Mexico thing. And so, so it's, not, it's not impossible. Because here's the problem with dependent variable one about implementation. And this is because maybe I've been really influenced by Frank Dobbins' work. Which is great stuff. Yeah, yeah on corporations and the yeah. US Civil Rights Act. Yeah. Is that there's a whole theater. Right. You know, there's a whole theater of compliance, right? So implementation and compliance, right? So, so there can be a lot of effort. There can be a lot of effort, but then it acquires its own logic, right? It acquires its own logic, and people can really try hard. But, but, but like, I, like the Department of Justice people who are supervising the University of New Mexico agreement, like, yeah, they just care that you're doing what you're supposed to do under the agreement. But they don't actually care that it's changing people's lives on the ground. They don't care. And I actually care about people's lives on the ground. And so yes, it's impossible. It's impossible outside of a controlled experiment or a very narrow kind of field experiment like the economists do. But I think we want to say something about the lives on the ground, even though it's impossible. <laughs> um, but we've done it, so I think that the, you know, the UN, the, the sexual harassment paper, but yeah, I think we want to say something, about, but yeah, we're never going to be able to identify it completely. Mm -hmm. That's fine. And that's fine. I've gotten Francesca past that, like she was the jazz Saikon student, you know, mm -hmm. who was like really trained her to be super rigid, but I've managed to kind of, mm -hmm. you know, relax her a bit about <laughs> causal inference over, over the years that we've been, we've been working together. And so, so yeah, no, I mean, I think it is impossible. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. Well, I, Can I, I ask? Yeah. But that's what right. No, no, after you. It wouldn't um, be fun. It wouldn't uh, be fun. I mean, I actually, the, the last thing I would say is um, it, I actually think there is emerging really good program evaluation work in, lot, in, the, in the areas I study. Yeah. And they're not all experimental. They're quasi-experimental. But there's like on, you know, did the California paid family leave have these impacts? There is a, a pretty good literature. It's yeah. not perfect, but I have pretty good confidence in those results. And so... It varies across areas, but there is more and more of this kind of good work coming out, I think. So, there is, so it's, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it's hard, but I think there are more and more people who are, who are doing good work trying to answer these questions. And um, I guess all I was really saying is just acknowledging those, those difficulties, I think, is, is important. But I think you also have a lot to say about the implementation side, too, because in I, to me, it's interesting whether the efforts are, you know, serious on the ground and the people are actually trying to implement or like they're just faking it and they're, you know, trying to avoid <laughs> blame. And there's a lot of that, too. And and um, and so I wouldn't like say that's not important and interesting to understand, because I would like to know why these bureaucratic actors, other actors are sometimes working well and implement the policy and other times they're not really. I think. Those are excellent points. Those are, I mean, yes. And that needs to come across in the book, even if it's not coming across here. Yeah. Yeah, so, sorry. There's so many. Maybe you should, can I? No, no, go ahead. So I, I had a kind of follow-up that kind of, I think, builds on, on Eric's question. I mean, I, so I was thinking of the, the case study that you had of Norway and Japan. 
And so there I feel as if it's an interesting case because I don't see intervention, I don't see implementation in the way that I, I thought I heard Eric talk about it. First, great talk, really excellent project. So I, I just, yeah. sorry, I, was, I should have begun with that. But so, you know, when you put a law on the books, which says you can either take these two weeks of, or, you know, two to 10, whatever period of time, or you lose the money, it doesn't seem as if there's like a frontline institution problem in terms of like, you know, is the University of New Mexico actually doing this training well? Are they invested in it? Are they just taking, uh, taking a box? Because it's a kind of, you know, center state puts in a law, and then you have the money, you take it or leave it, right? It's, it's not like a, a developing country context in which you might think middlemen are pocketing the money or whatever. So that to me is an interesting case because you can just look at implementation and almost control and say that in a way, like you can look at compliance saying implementation doesn't matter. And there I think you have a really interesting story and I was just wondering if you agreed with the way that I would say it to you because I think that, you know, right now you're saying a lot of different stuff matters, but I feel as if there's a certain sequencing story that seemed implicit in the empirics that you presented. So so in Norway, you put the law on the books and it works. In Japan, you put the law on the books, it's actually a more generous compensation and it doesn't work. And so to me, the question, so you know, you when you kind of said the takeaways, you said, oh, the takeaways is that money can work under certain conditions, coercion can work under certain conditions. But to me, the, it seems as if, no, you're actually saying something a little bit more theoretically specific. You're saying that actually, laws will not work in or laws with financial incentives so money will not work unless norms are already in place so japan can give you know crazy amounts of money it's not going to lead to those good looking baby carrier men <laughs> because there's a certain kind of patriarchal model of kinship or child rearing so I, I wonder whether you'd agree with that because i think that's a really powerful argument which is that laws or fiscal incentives or carrots or sticks yeah. in the absence of kind of norm change are actually going to have modest to no effect and so I, I, I just feel as if like you have these really interesting cases. And so the way that I would frame the kind of Norway, Japan case would be, I think, exactly to Eric's point, which is that here's a case in which you can look exactly at compliance and not care so much about the intermediary institutions and one in which you can say norms kind of trump laws, especially with fiscal incentives. So that was just one just one way to think about it. Should we gather or oh, yeah maybe um, let me just say I, I i really like that a lot um yeah i really like i really like that i think though that it's important because we're looking at norway now let's imagine we're in 1986 when this masculinity commission got going i think it was really different i mean i think that the, the norms weren't there they it's like they they pushed norm change with this law they catalyzed it you know, it's really a chicken and the egg thing. Yeah. Like, so that, how did that happen, but it didn't happen in Japan? Like, will Japan ever get norm change? Like, what needs to happen? But we're having dinner, so I mean, yeah, 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 no, <laughs> so let's talk about it. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, but I'm glad that you, like, get into this puzzle, because we're obsessed with this puzzle about Japan. Yeah. Oh, no. well, Eric and I are both having dinner, right? So we can, right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. But we're going we're gonna to write, rewrite the book at dinner. Thank you. I, I'm, a, I'm a beneficiary of the Norwegian policy because I have a, have a house in Berkeley that I rent to visiting Norwegians, and it's often men on their paternity leave. So, um, but you know, I, this is so interesting. I was also intrigued with the um, with the Japan Norway um, comparison. But w when when you were done, I wrote, okay, the answer is law plus, yeah. and so I kind of think one thing you might do is think about what are the different pluses that you have and try to characterize them and i was just playing with it and one of them in japan it seems it's so massive it's the fit with a whole bunch of existing institutions right you had the pension tax etc so there might be something about the fit and in mexico it seemed like the plus was social movement somehow something's getting the message is getting diffused. The law is getting diffused into knowledge. And it would be interesting. To, I mean, I haven't read the article, which maybe I'll look for now, but just to, you know, what are the mechanisms of diffusion? It seems like social movements are one. And then in the bureaucratic case, it is these meso level actors in bureaucracy. So maybe thinking about your different contexts and thinking about what the plus is. And, and um, but anyway, it's really, really generative work, really interesting. Yeah. So thank you. No, I, 
that's really important. And it's, you know, it's just having to give this talk that we're trying to think more systematically about what the stories are adding up to. And so that's exactly, this is exactly what I need to be thinking about. But yes, the plus, and can we systematically say, here are the pluses and here are the pluses for this box. Do you want me to go over here? I, I can speak pretty loud without it, but um, I'm curious also to know, you're talking about it a lot from the top down and, yeah. and laws, and I'm curious, I, I noticed that in one of your studies you had it, it starts in 2003 and it goes until 2016, and the one really dominant change that happened there is pr uh, proliferation of cell phone usage and social media and people, you know, younger generations and even old, I mean, I know that for myself, um, I don't think I really got, I didn't get my first cell phone, I think. It was somewhere in that interim when I had small children. And um, and over, and then when I got a cell phone, I didn't have it on me very often. I mean, I had it for when I needed it, but now I have it with me every single second of the day. And if I don't have it, I feel very uncomfortable without it. And I know that a lot of, um, attitudes are being shaped by what's going on with social media, et cetera, et cetera. This is all, you know, everyone knows all of this. But, um, but I'm curious to know, just because when I saw those dates, that's what struck me. Yeah. I thought, well, that certainly has to be an element of why it's not, it's not necessarily in that situation working from the top down. It may just be women saying, <laughs> we're not doing this anymore, and I can see this on my, all my social media that nobody's putting up with this anymore. Um, so, and I know, I mean, that's, I mean, I'm seeing it from an American standpoint, but I think it does, I mean, I have two daughters that are living in other parts of the world right now, and they com comment on this quite frequently, actually, um, in terms of how their generation is responding to things like violence against women, et cetera. So, just curious if that was part of your consideration. So, I really like the way that you looked at the dates. And you pointed out that this is, you know, a time period when social media is exploding. Like, when was, when did Facebook first appear on college campuses? I mean, it was before that, but it has, it has exploded. Um, it was Zuckerberg at Harvard, I guess. Yeah, but was it 2000 or, yeah, two, about 2000, yeah. So, it, so this is exactly the time period. So my view on social media, and of course, like, my gut, my gut and my instinct also as a parent is that, you know, as you said, this is responsible for a lot of attitude change, a lot of norm change, a lot of behavioral change. But the evidence, you know, is, is, is actually, I mean, I think there's good evidence that it's led to depression. But in terms of norm change, like in a progressive direction or in a, you know, regressive direction, I think it's both. Like, I mean, I think, I think of it as sort of a vehicle, like just an empty vessel and you can have like, you know, the Tucker Carlson direction or, um, you know, a radical feminist direction. But it can like accelerate, it can accelerate people's priors in totally different, in totally different ways. So at the same time, yes, maybe it is facilitating norm change among, you know, youth in Mexico, but it's also leading to, to genocidal genocidal episodes in Burma and, you know, pogroms, anti-Muslim pogroms in, in, in India. Like, it's, so it's doing all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, yeah, there is a lot of literature that this is progressive and it's, it's furthering social movements, but I think it's also furthering, you know, racism and genocide. And so I think it's, I don't know, my view is that it's hard, it's hard to pin down. It's hard to pin down. But there are experimental studies some experimental studies like in Rwanda and in Oaxaca showing that it can facilitate like this common knowledge phenomenon where people see others are adhering to a norm and that it makes the norm more likely to to take and so social media can do that yeah um, so I, I really like the talk and I like the project but it's interesting you start at the global level and then you immediately pivot to the organizational level and ultimately, you want a global story. Um, and this is going to get me back to Japan. But the way I'm going to get there is to say, I think that once you want to scale back up to the global level, separating the adoption of the law from the implementation of law is going to be a huge problem. 
And whether you want to think about it as a problem in the sort of causal inference selection effects way, or just a comparative historical way, it's a problem. Because you don't even get to the population in which you can enforce it unless you've passed the law in the first place. Mm -hmm. And getting back to Japan, you can look at Japan and say, the puzzle is, why aren't they enforcing these laws? Or you can look at Japan and say, I'm shocked they adopted these laws in the first place. And I'm in the latter camp. I think it's really shocking they adopted these laws. And when I say, why did they adopt these laws, I say, demography. This is a dem demography story. And when I think about what's the single overarching variable driving this, you answered that question at the organizational level and said representation is what's driving this at the organizational level. At the global level, I think what's driving all of these changes is demography. As fertility declines, women gain more power. We've known that for 100 years. Among other, you know, there are a countless mechanisms for that. And as fertility declines, even a society like Japan that has historically been extraordinarily patriarchal is going to have to make some concessions on the legal front and eventually on the enforcement front. Um, but I think if you're trying to scale this back up to the global level, you know, you can do it by saying Dimaggio and Powell, it's norms, it's economics, and it's coercion. But as Dimaggio and Powell point out 40 years ago, separating these empirically is almost impossible. And you've talked about that today. The thing that does consistently account for almost everything you're talking about is household relations and fertility. And we could talk about it more over dinner. So, you know, you're identifying in the case of Japan, you know, people who are in a car, let's say it's self driven, hurtling toward the edge of a cliff, and nobody is bothering to like push the off button. So yes, I mean, demography is hurtling in a country toward the cliff. And they're not doing anything. They're not enforcing this. They're not, um, you know, they're overworking themselves to death. Like, nobody's having kids. They're putting robots in nursing homes. Yeah, nobody's, nobody's having kids. Like, the people who are like 80 are, you know, mopping the floor in the metro station. Yeah. Like, it's totally insane. And nobody is pushing off. Like, no, but there isn't kind of meso level kind of collective action to change these family dynamics. And so, like... What's your so story for why they passed the law? Not for why they don't enforce, but why they did pass it. Enlightened elites seeing where the country is going and trying to, you know, uh, change the course of the ship, of the Titanic, before the iceberg, you know, appears. But, but the point is those same elites you know, are also working themselves to death. Um, you know, not hiring women, not hiring mothers. Like that's it's, a just so story. It's not a global account. Well, I, you I don't start with the global level, right? I mean, you want a global theory, not a bunch of just so stories. That don't well, right out. now it is. It is. It is just so serious. But I think that you like. You're saying demography. I mean, you seem to be saying demography is a story, and that gets the laws passed. And we know that demography accounts for a lot in the global north, right? It accounts for a lot of these equality policies in the global north. And the south. But it's, but it's opposite also about the how democracy, demography is constructed, right, Andrew? I mean, you have the same, India and China have the same fertility rate in the 1950s. Mao thinks that that is a kind of demographic dividend, an asset, right? And Nehru thinks it's a Malthusian population bomb. So I don't think it's a story only for demography. I think, you know, and I don't think it's, you well, know, nothing's so a story only for anything. I mean, I think the question is, you know, what's left out if you want to try to explain the global account? And I think one thing that's left out that's super important is declining fertility rates everywhere, albeit at different paces. And, you know, then there's a demographic problem, particularly but in the global accounts for the, the That accounts well. for the front side. Mm -hmm. It doesn't account for the back side, for the implementation. And this is why I, I, I think Japan, and I'm talking about the self-driving car hurtling toward the abyss, because People can know what's right, but people, you know, I, because I've been in the micro interstices of like, you know, training and stuff and trying to change behavior in these STEM departments. And you can't present people with data and get them to adjust their behavior. They don't adjust, they don't change their behavior when they see the light and they see data and, and they're rationally convinced. They don't change their behavior, and that's what's happening in Japan. But they changed their behavior. They passed a law. That's, that's behavior. not behavioral change. That is behavior. It's that's not. The, the, the that's, not that's not behavior. Passing a law is not behavioral change. Do you think they don't want to enforce that law, or do you think they can't? 
What's can't? Define what's, what's define what? define can't. What's what? What's enlightened? What's an elite? We'll talk over dinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. But I think that demography explains the front side. And I think it's, it's an artificial the separation. Side. Okay. Yes. All right. All right. Um, the mechanisms that we're focusing on for compliance with the coercion incentive, with the financial incentive, and with norm are all rationalist mechanisms. And I know that's going to, anyway, it's going to trigger you. <laughs> um, all right. <laughs> I, I should add we have wine and cheese outside, so okay, we can. This is we great. Could Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you so for so the great time.